Hello, everyone. Uh, so just getting right into responding to the questions. Uh, question one asks, what is a valid point that Hess makes in responding to Ravitch? And I think that Hess uh, accurately characterizes the uh, perspectives of uh, Ravitch and what he calls the plucky resistance and uh, the re privatizing reformers. Uh, in his article, as he describes, both of them seem to view solutions in education as one size fits all, stemming from national policy. Um, Ravitch herself seems to indicate this perspective in her own essay, where she emphasizes the importance of instruction and curriculum. And the reform with the reformers, uh, obviously, there's a there's a heavy focus on accountability and choice. Uh, but I think Hess does accurately uh, criticize both movements for ignoring the importance or the influence that uh, local districts have when it comes to actually implementing these policies and how assuming that these policies will be implemented the same way and properly across the board is naive. Uh, so that's a good point that I agree with, with Hess, although I do think that Hess does overreach when he uh, seems to characterize early on in his article that the reform movement is over and that the resistance has won in the sense that they seem to have halted the push for uh, reform along the lines of uh, school choice and accountability. Uh, and that, I think, stands out as uh, obviously a mischaracterization as many of those policies have not really been reversed or overturned. You still have a large uh, portion of the political establishment that endorses those views. And I think, I, I, I really disagree with his apparent uh, belief that the resistance is won and the reform movement is over. Uh, that, to me, uh, if he doesn't believe that, that, I think that phrasing should have been clarified when he described that in his article. Moving on to uh, the article I chose, I chose uh, Hinchley's article, Starting Points. And uh, my first crucial concept I took away from this article is that uh, behavioral habits develop out of our assumptions. Uh, and these, these habits develop subconsciously, and these assumptions can be things that we either develop on our own or that are passed down to us by authority figures. And as teachers, this is important to bear in mind, and it's important for teachers to reevaluate and be aware of their own assumptions because of the uh, decent chance that they could inadvertently uh, pass down faulty assumptions to their students, resulting in their students developing um, just bad, uh, behavioral habits, uh, habits based on assumptions that are flawed or incorrect that could lead to trouble down the road. Uh, my second crucial concept, uh, Hinchley seems to emphasize how one of the most important assumptions a teacher can have is their assumption on the purpose of education and that they're, this, depending on what their assumption of that role is, uh, kind of divides them into one of two uh, categories. One essentially describes uh, traditionalists who seem to assume that the purpose of education is to create loyal, obedient citizens, uh, productive and dedicated and efficient workers who uh, will complete their tasks uh, effectively and efficiently without complaint, and uh, to reinforce traditional values. Uh, then the other side, which she very clearly endorses, the critical theorists or critical educators, uh, which she describes, assume that education uh, is really, it's a vehicle of, so, of social equality and alleviating inequality, and that the purpose of education is to uh, create uh, involved, critical thinking, and independent citizens who will use their education to challenge societal inequality. Uh, and my third uh, crucial concept is kind of how she encourages these, or uh, believes that these two categories can be used to encourage uh, reflection within teachers uh, and result in 
more uh, refined teaching practices, uh, and that is that teachers should implement what she calls praxis, or um, action that is based on reflection. And basically uh, arguing that a teacher should, there, that there is no uh, one size fits all approach when it comes to effective teaching. There is no recipe or formula that will make any teacher effective. Um, rather, it's all going to depend on that individual teacher's strengths and kind of based on, well, uh, on, on their strengths and that they should use their uh, praxis or their reflection uh, to shape their future teaching uh, to play to their strengths and play off of the unique characteristics of this teacher, this school, and that specific classroom dynamic. And ultimately, uh, it will make teaching, strat teaching styles much more individualistic, and much more effective in the long run. Getting on to question three, uh, what I think is the most urgent priority for improving school systems? Uh, for me, I think that a lot of the problems addressed in these reading in the readings this week, like uh, the push for standardized testing or the school choice movement and uh, just greater accountability and tying accountability to funding. To me, those are all symptoms of a much larger problem, and that is um, a misunderstanding of what the purpose of education is. Um, it seems that uh, Hinchley does accurately characterize the traditional focus of education as being on uh, preparing students to get a job and participate in society at large. And uh, to me, I'll, that emphasis on we need to get these students ready for a job is kind of the root of the majority of the problems. So for me, reframing the purpose of education away from the, per the point of this is to get a job into something more, al more along the lines of the point of this is to make you uh, a truly independent person where getting a job is part of that, but the other parts are also uh, that a person can think for themselves and solve problems uh, by themselves. Conversely, something I think that school systems do well is that I think many schools do do a good sense of building a sense of community, both within uh, the, the student body and the faculty, but also with the community at large as well. Particularly in smaller communities, schools really do serve an important role in facilitating community interaction and kind of tying the community together. And going on to the last question, basically, where do we go from here? What do we change and what does that change look like? Um, so kind of going off of what I had said, that the main priority is that we need to reframe people's perspective on the purpose of education. Um, I think schools need to work on developing an appreciation both within students, but as well as the surrounding community, uh, developing an appreciation and a value for education, for education's sake. Um, and it, to me, that kind of gives a lot more of student agency and choice in the direction of where they want to go uh, in their life. It prevents us from taking a one-size-fits-all perspective and kind of leaving more options open for students. Uh, so within the school, some reforms that or uh, actions that could uh, reflect that could be curricular reforms that emphasize giving greater school a uh, greater student choice, um, greater emphasis on the humanities, uh, kind of kind of reflecting Ravitch's uh, complaint that there's been too much emphasis on STEM, and I think focusing more on the humanities uh, could develop a broader appreciation for education and overall an emphasis on student independence. So again, giving greater student choice and student-centered instruction, and uh, trying to provide different options or opportunities depending on whatever unique path that uh, students want to take. Um, thanks for listening, and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing what everybody else has to say.